you are here. We give thanks that you are waking us up. Whether we like it or not, and we do like it right good, Lord, you are waking us up. Now, Lord, I pray that your power will go forth on all the projects we have, to the special one we want healed, to the one that we want completely forgiven, but most of all, dear Lord Jesus, to the awakening of our own spirits and the releasing of our full power in you and your full power in us so that this world that we live in can become the kingdom of heaven and so that your church and I mean all your churches will awake and know their heritage and their power and become places of healing and light and salvation. Thank you, Lord. I know this is your will, and I rejoice believing it's going to be so. You remember a day or two ago, I told you quite a long tale about Harry Goldsmith. I've learned so much from and through that Jewish boy who was healed, five inches of bone built into his leg where there hadn't been any bone. It was all sh shot out by shrapnel. I tell you, about two or three years ago when he was working with me in a conference on the, on the West Coast, and I saw him in the morning, he'd get up and run his two miles up and down the seashore. <laughs> that was a joyous sight. Well, before he was completely well, but when he was out of the hospital, and you know, I stopped to tell you this. He had to get a job that first summer. Well, he was an ignorant Jewish immigrant, not mm, too attractive looking. I mean, he has a lovely face, but he, he just is not, when you first see him, you don't see it, you know, so much. And with a heavy accent and no education, except high school, and that I think was in Czechoslovakia, and he had to get a job. Well, we prayed and we prayed and we prayed for him to get the right job. And he'd go and interview people and they turn him down. Then one time I said, Harry, I've got it, I know what. Next time you go interview somebody, don't pray for you to get the job. Pray for the person to get the right man for the job, whether it's you or who it is. <laughs> and you know, his face brightened up. He said, that will work. And it did. He told me the first time he had an interview after that, the lady who interviewed him looked so cross and so sour, and he was praying for her to get the right man for the job, and then he noticed how unhappy she looked, so he started just praying for her, <laughs> just silently, you know. And she said, he said all of a sudden, she looked at him, and she smiled, and her whole face got different, you know. People can pick up even just this silent prayer. He said, she didn't give me the job. I was not the right man for the job, but it was, it was grand. It made me feel real happy praying that way. Well, so the next time he did get the job, and it was a better job than he had any right to hope for with a good salary in a lovely air-conditioned office in New York. And you know what he was? <laughs> he was Betty Crocker. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That is, he was in charge of the advertising, you know. Well, anyhow, he came down to Morristown, and the first time he came, I said, Harry, come in the church a minute. Harry said, no, I don't want to. I should have told you I have a prejudice against churches. And I said, Harry, I understand that. And that's not your fault. That's our fault. Because we Christian people have not shown the love of Christ to you people, and I'm sorry. However, I said, I've got a special reason now, and it's not going to hurt you. Come on now, just step in one step. So I took him in the side door like this, and he took one step in, and he looked around. Oh, he said, it's here. I said, what is here? He said, the power that heals. I said, how do you know? He said, why, well, I feel it. It's like electricity in the air. Don't you feel it? I said, not exactly. Not like that, really. I suppose I'm just used to it. Or maybe I'm not so sensitive as you are. But I said, I know it is here because healings happen. Every time there's a church service, healings happen. 
Now, my dear husband was the best pastor I ever knew in my life, but he was very, very conservative. And it's a wonder he put up with me, but it was a good combination because when I would go to dark too far off here, you know, he'd kind of pull me back. And when he tended to get a little too stuck in a rut, I kind of pulled him out. I mean, it wasn't the easiest thing in the world, but it worked. <laughs> Listen, don't be too mad with the Lord if he, somehow you get hitched up to somebody who's just as different from you as can be. You know, I kind of think the Lord does that on purpose. <laughs> maybe it's for the development of the character of both of them, and I'm quite serious, or maybe it is to maintain the balance in the family. Don't you see? So, anyhow, he was a very, very conservative minister. He did not ever preach about healing, and that was real smart. But the congregation learned, and I'll tell you how. They learned because in just almost any sermon, he would just tell a little story of God's healing, you see. Just tell it and drop it and leave it. You see, after a while, they got used to the idea without anybody taking a fit and, and getting excited. But, and so that was one reason why the healing power could grow there, grow there, because we did have a minister who, though very, very conservative, nevertheless really believed in Jesus and really believed Jesus could heal. Now, how can you get one like that? I'm <laughs> going to tell you presently. <laughs> but first I want to tell you how... Th now, that permitted the power to grow. But there was something else that really and truly planted and watered seeds of faith. And it was my gang, as the children called it, you know. We didn't have any name. The ladies, the people that came to my prayer group and came to my uh, Bible class and so on, the children would say, Mom, there goes one of your gang into the chapel. <laughs> and that's the only name they ever had. <laughs> you know, real Christianity is an organism, not an organization. Now, we have to have some organizations for the organism to grow in. But the less organization we can manage to do, <laughs> I think just the bare minimum, what you've got to have, Tell you now, I don't belong to any organization whatsoever except the Episcopal Church. And through that, I trust the Church of Christ. So, one of the, who was it, Jim or somebody said, narrow down, narrow down, narrow down. So we did not make a different organization. It was just those of us who prayed. And some of us decided, now it wasn't all of us, and I really sort of forget how it started, but some of us decided to make our main project Sunday morning and the services Sunday morning, all day Sunday. I went to all of them, early communion, taught the Bible class, went to communion at 11 o'clock. Sometimes I got just a little bit worn out and frazzled in temper. <laughs> oh, I remember one time i just come back from a mission and I was tired and I was extremely unpopular in the family at that moment. Because various things had happened, and I was not there to attend to it when the coffee pot burned out, or the baby, not the baby. I know I never went away when my children were real little, but uh, somebody hurt his knee or something. Well, anyhow, so I was in kind of a bad mood. I was trying to get dinner on the table, and the congregation were coming in the front door and coming in the side door to ask me this and tell me that, and the phone rang. And I picked it up, and a voice mentioning his name said, Will you come to my city and do a mission in my church? And I said, No, I'm never going to do another mission. Bang, and hung up the phone. <laughs> and my husband said, Who was it you were talking to like that? I said, Oh, I don't know. He said his name was Austin Pardue. <laughs> That's our best-known bishop in the Episcopal Church. <laughs> well, what could I do except just drown myself? I mean, I couldn't say I'm sorry. <laughs> I couldn't say I'm sorry I yelled at you. I didn't know you were a bishop. <laughs> well, anyway, that was the way Sunday morning was. But just the same, it was the high point of the whole week. So... Uh, this little, I don't know how many people there were. We didn't have a counter. This was never organized. But quite a number of us made it our job 
to do this now. We'd go to the church about 10 minutes early, and there we'd kneel or sit in the pews, and praise God in the Episcopal Church, it is the custom to keep silence until the service begins. After which you can talk, but it's the custom. Now, this would be more difficult if, you know, it's an awful good custom, because the idea, of course, that you remain in silent prayer, that's the idea, and build up power for the service. Now, this would be more difficult if you're in a church where everybody chats and chats until it begins, but still you can do the best you can. <laughs> Shut your eyes and pretend to be asleep or real dumb or something, <laughs> and maybe people won't talk to you. <laughs> really, that's what I do if I'm having a mission in a church where people want to talk. I sit there and I just simply keep my eyes closed. And I'm in silent prayer, and to look at me, they know I'm either that or asleep or dead, one or the other. <laughs> so <laughs> don't talk. <laughs> So we go in there early, and we would pray in silence, and this is what we would pray. For the presence and the power of Jesus Christ to fill that church. Now, you know that can happen. The power is increasing in this place. Night before last, when Jim was talking, I could just see the light all around. Last night when I was, I'm afraid I was too tired. <laughs> I shouldn't really do a big prayer group, and then they talk too close together. But even then, I could see a little bit. So we would pray for the presence of Jesus Christ to fill that church. Then, when the choir and the minister came in, we all prayed for the minister. But now look, I said to them, and this is very important, I said, now look, don't pray for him to believe what you want him to believe or do what you want him to do. Just pray for the Spirit of Jesus entering into him to quicken and arouse up in him whatever are his highest potentials. Now, you know this is very important. God gave people free will. We have really no right to pray against their free will. Many people make this mistake. They pray for their son or their daughter. Oh, Lord, make him do this or make her do that, you see? Now, maybe it's the best thing to do, but if we sort of try to force it on them by prayer in the first place, we'll be rather unpopular. In the second place, for a peculiar reason, <laughs> probably won't work. But if we pray for God to be in them and arouse up in them whatever is their highest potential and lead them according to his will, it's far more likely to work. So we would all pray that way for the minister. Don't remember praying for the choir? I guess they were doing all right. And then... <laughs> and then I'd say to them, now, the next thing, you just kind of glance around a little bit and see if there's anybody in that church whose face makes you feel uncomfortable so that you don't like to look at them. And if so, begin by praying a prayer of forgiveness for that person. Now, you don't have to try to kid yourself. I don't think that way works very well. It, it may be all right, but it's not as good as this other way. I said, if they're really mean and disagreeable, you don't have to try to say, oh, no, they're sweet and lovely because, you know, you're only lying. You don't believe it when you say it, and so it doesn't do any real good. Uh -huh. Of course, if you can see the possibility that they will become sweet and lovely, that's great. So in other words, that's just what I told my gang. I said, now, you, you, you can be honest. You can say to yourself, no, I don't like her. She's mean and disagreeable. All right. So far, so good. But now the next thing you've got to do so is to clear the decks so that Jesus can get through and really do his job in there. You pray for the love of Jesus to come into you and then go through you to that person and heal whatever old sorrows and bitterness made that person be mean and disagreeable and bring out the best potential or possibility in that person and make that person kind and agreeable. And then you say, thank you, Lord. I believe that is being done now. Now, let me tell you, this is the most powerful way of prayer that I know, and right in church is the best way that there is to pray it. Because, see, there they are. They can't answer you back. They, they can't get away. They 
where they sit. To some extent, anyway, their minds are open to prayer. So don't you see? It's the best place that I know to pray this kind of prayer. And the way this kind of prayer works is just absolutely miraculous. I have known it to work instantaneously. Now, not always. Sometimes it takes a long time. But I have known it to work instantaneously. There was a man said to me after church one Sunday, he said, what happened to me? Were you praying for me in church? I said, no, I wasn't. But I'm sure somebody was, because always somebody. He said, well, I was feeling just as mean and disagreeable as I could possibly feel. And I didn't want to come to church, but my wife made me come, and that made me crosser than ever. And I was sitting there just feeling perfectly terrible. And then all of a sudden, it just cleared up. And I felt warm and happy and somebody must have been praying for me see i said well i don't know who it was but i'm sure somebody was so now i said to the to them to my gang i said now this is a must this is what you've got to do because unless you do this you've got a block in your own mind you see and you'll receive some help from church, but not as much as you could. And furthermore, you won't be able to give it. So, okay, this is what they did next. And then, after that, we usually had just one special project, like I told you, choose one for this school. Sometimes we would share them. Sometimes Jeannie would say, well, you take one of mine, I've got three. And I'd say, okay, I'll take one of yours if you'll take one of mine. But this was never spoken out loud. I mean, my husband never said, now we're asked to pray for so-and-so. For a real good reason, too. Well, first of all, he believed in saying just what was in the prayer book, no more, no less, bless his heart. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked, too. But the other reason is that sometimes, if you do that, there are some people in the congregation that don't know about the prayer of faith. And there's some people that like that maybe will say, oh, poor old George Brown. Now, I wonder what's the matter with him now. That poor man, he's such a great sufferer. <laughs> Don't you see? <laughs> so, so there's your prayer stopped right there. Because, you see, that's a statement of unbelief. They wouldn't say that if they believed he was going to get well right that minute. So, that's, so there's your prayer stopped right there. So actually, it's better for just a few people or a prayer group to decide. Now, we're going to pray for this in church Usually that works better than to get the minister to mention the name. Although, occasionally, if you feel strongly guided, you can get the minister to mention the name. But I'm telling you, it's liable to start more gossip than prayer, so I, I suggest the other way. So let me, I'll tell you now, the most wonderful miracles that I know took place not through prayer with the laying on of hands, one person to another, but right there in the church service. And I've got a friend sitting right here. <laughs> I remember who one time called up from Norfolk, Virginia, and she asked if I would pray, if my husband would pray. I forget whether I was there or whether just Ted was there. Would pray for a sailor down there in Norfolk who'd been having bleeding stomach ulcers for two years, and he'd lived on nothing but pablum, and he was supposed to be in a more or less dying condition. And if we would pray at the 8 o'clock communion service, and she took the trouble to go and over there and sit by the bed with his wife during that time. So she told me, and I wouldn't dare tell this story, except she's sitting right there, and I'll ask her afterwards, have I got it right or not? <laughs> she told me that the next day she was walking around downtown in Norfolk, and she saw him walking up and down the street. She said, what in the world are you doing here? He said, well, didn't you all pray for me? I'd forgotten how good hamburger and onions does taste. <laughs> Is that the way of it, Lee? Is that the way of it? Well, I can't quite hear her, but she's nodding, so I guess that's just about the way of it. I'll check and recheck after. I know I checked once before, and she said, yes, that's true. Now, I wouldn't recommend his hopping out of bed and eating hamburger and onions. If I'd been there, I'd have said to him, now, look, you stay quietly in bed and eat what you're supposed to for a day or two and give this time. <laughs> but he didn't stay quietly in bed, and as I recall the story, 
um, it worked. Now, you know, then we would look around and, well, maybe not look around, but then finally we would pray for the whole congregation. And we would pray that anyone who needed healing would receive healing. We didn't, might not know who they were. And at a communion service, when they went up to the rail, we would pray for everyone who went up to the rail to really and truly receive the body and blood of Christ with all the healing and life-giving power that was there. And do you know the power of healing increased so in that church in a very quiet way? This was never told. It was never advertised. Never, not once. I said to my husband toward the last of the 23 years, what proportion of the congregation do you suppose knows about what we do in church? And he said, well, I would guess about two-thirds, maybe. And I said, well, that's interesting. I would have thought only about half. We didn't talk about it. We didn't go up to anybody and grab them and say, do you have the Holy Spirit? But it grew so that more and more people knew it. My husband was probably right when he said about three-fourths. And lots of people would come to the church on purpose, like one man told me. He said, I woke up with a terrible thrombosis in my leg, and I'd had it before, and it can be real bad. So I thought, if I can just get myself to church, it'll be all right. And he said it was an awful struggle to get there. Now, this was not even communion. This was morning prayer at 11 o'clock. But he said, I finally made it. And during the church service, nothing changed. But as soon as the service was over, when I was standing on the steps outside, the pain went away, and I was perfectly all right. Now, I happen to know the other side of that story, but I didn't tell him, not ever. These things very often work best in quietness. Now, there are times to tell. But I would say nine times out of ten, it works best if you don't talk about it. <laughs> I happen to know the other side of the story. Another man in the congregation who owned a dried beef business, and if you looked at him, you'd never think he was a spiritually minded man. But he was, and he had learned about prayer because I had gone to pray for him when he had tuberculosis, and the doctor had said he had to stay flat in bed, and he got right straight up out of bed and went and drove his meat trucks if one of the drivers couldn't come that day. Now, I don't approve of this. I do not, but that's what he did. <laughs> and the doctor said, if you keep on with this, you're going to be dead in six weeks. And he said, in six weeks, you can take an x-ray of my lungs, and I'll show you a perfect pair of lungs. So he did, too. Well, anyway, this man happened to be sitting by the other one with a thrombosis in church, and he told me about it. The second man told me about it. And he said, I noticed that he was very uncomfortable. He kept wiggling around and sort of moaning a little. And I noticed that one leg seemed to be swollen. So I made that my prayer project for the service. And he said, the way I pray for people is, I just keep praying until in my mind I can see Jesus standing there with his hand on it. So he said, I did that. And he said, nothing seemed to change then, but the next day I saw him on the street, and he said, oh, I hope I didn't bother you Sunday morning. I was quite uncomfortable. I had this thrombosis in my leg. And he said, it was a funny thing. As soon as the service was over, when I was standing on the church steps, all of a sudden it just got well. And my friend, the dried beef man, said, oh, yeah, funny thing. Well, <laughs> see you again. Now, do you know it's a temptation to say, oh, I prayed for you? <laughs> you know, people some say, sometimes say, oh, I give Jesus all the glory. And I think, oh, yeah. Because <laughs> first they tell you what they did, and then they say, I give Jesus all the glory. Big of them, huh? <laughs> Best way to give Jesus all the glory is unless you have to, for some good and sufficient reason, not to tell what you did. And that way the power grows and grows. And so now, I have a very serious plea. You know, I'm worried about the churches. I am worried about them. I've told you about this one. This was 25 years ago. I don't see many like that nowadays. In fact, I see many churches 
Well, all they know how to talk about is, uh, uh, what's this stuff, social service or uh, uh, act activism of some kind. What's the other word? Social action, that kind of stuff. You know, now that's all very well, but that is not Christianity any more than having a woman's book club is Christianity. I mean, it's okay, but it's not what Jesus did, and it's not what Jesus said to do. It's fine as a secondary outgrowth of the real thing. But the real thing is do is to do what Jesus said. And he said, heal the sick and preach the gospel. And what's the gospel? It's the good news that Jesus Christ came on earth to forgive sins and say unto them, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. Now those are the direct commands of Jesus. Incidentally, he did not say that your main duty was to go to people and say, do you speak with tongues? No. He didn't. You know, I'm very kind of simple, I guess. When I began to get interested in this healing business, I didn't know anybody in the world that could tell me anything about it. You know, I was sort of a pioneer. There were some outfits, but I didn't know about them. So I made up my mind, well, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to read the four Gospels and see what Jesus said and see what Jesus did and try to do it. And for the time being, while I'm learning, I'm not going to believe, I'm not going to pay any attention to what anybody else says, in the Bible or out of the Bible. Not Moses or Abraham or St. Paul or my husband, the minister, or anybody else. I mean, if it goes contrary to what Jesus said. So, I just take note of what Jesus said and what Jesus did and try to do it. Then the other things add themselves to it, you see. I'm not saying the other things are wrong, but I mean the other things are secondary. They come later. They're sort of outgrowths. But here is the central thing. To have such faith that the sick are healed when they come near to go to those who are sick or in trouble and carry the good news, the gospel of healing and salvation and help. And to say to them, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. That's, I'm not making this up. I have nothing to do about this. This is not my choice. This is just simply what Jesus said. So now the very best way we can do this is in the churches, but poor dears, it's not the fault of our ministers. It really isn't. And I'm not going to, I don't want to get you stirred up about the fault, but I want to ask you, I want to beseech you to take on a prayer project. Now, I've suggested you take one person for this school. Now I'm going to suggest a prayer project that I would like you to try for one year. And do you know, I have the most amazing hope in this. Olivia, who happens to be a Negro woman minister in a great big northern city. Some of you know her, I guess. She was here once, I believe. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't size people up on a, because of what color they happen to be. Neither do I say they're all the same. Praise God, they're not all the same. Made us all different. Thank you, Lord. It would have been such a bore if we were all the same. <laughs> Yeah, but I just appreciate them according to what they are, and this little brown woman is a saint of the Lord, no question about it. Now, she makes her biggest prayer project the maintaining of the peace in that big northern city where she lives. It has a tremendous dark con uh, population, and there have time and again been plans to riot and burn down part of the city and fight with the police and all kinds of things. Quite elaborate plans. There's a strong communistic influence in this city. And do you know, nothing has ever happened? Now, every single day in the week, this little brown lady and some of her congregation, most of whom are women, have a prayer group for this one purpose, and that is to maintain the peace of that city. And the first Friday of every week, no, first Friday of every month, they pray all night long. And at 4 o'clock in the morning, and this is really funny, they take a little table like that out on the sidewalk, and they put a big open Bible on it, and they all stand around it with their hands upraised, so you know they're praying. 
and they pray for the peace of that city. And Olivia says they choose Friday because Saturday is the devil's playtime and they're going to get ahead of him. <laughs> <laughs> and she says real often a prowl car will come by, you know, a police car, and they'll look suspiciously at this group of dark people assembled on the sidewalk at 4 o'clock in the morning. Then they'll see the Bible and Olivia will say, we're praying for you all. <laughs> and they'll just beam at them. Of course they do. So now one time Olivia was working with me in a conference up north in Whitensville, and she suggested that a number of ladies, this was a woman's group, that a number of women each choose a different city and pray for the city in that concentrated fashion, making it our main prayer project for one year. Now, this was in the spring, just before that summer, you know, when all the newspapers said it's going to be a long, hot summer, remember? And do you remember it didn't happen? All right, I'm telling you why. The power of this kind of prayer is just tremendous. So then, another time, during the time that there was so much rioting and carrying on in the colleges, you know, and those four students were shot in that college and so on. I was at some meeting, I forget whether it was the CFO or what it was, and I asked people, those who were willing to do this, each one to choose a college and to pray for the peace of God to surround that college. Do you know it's changed? It has changed. Now, USC at Berkeley, California, was about the worst of all, and I've been there, and such a lot of weird-looking creatures roaming around. You never saw. <clears throat> and, you know, I've been told that the whole emphasis has changed and that this hippie group, they're more or less sort of hippie group, you know. This is not the Jesus people. It's just ones that haven't gotten into that yet. Just, well, we call them the hippies, sort of. That now... <clears throat> Their great interest is in spiritual power. And every class in religion is filled two or three times over and there isn't room for them. Now, you know, in a way that's glorious, but in another way it's frightening. Suppose they do get into those classes, what will they learn? I know one professor in the seminary there that tells the students, now I know this of a certainty, he's the one that wrote the book, God is Dead. And he tells them that. And he says, you might as well call him Garfinkel. <laughs> so one time he was saying, oh, Garfinkel, and there came an earthquake. <laughs> 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 but I don't think it scared him enough. <laughs> so now, I would not say this in order to criticize people, and I am not criticizing these seminary professors and these seminary students, but I am stating a fact for a very good reason. That is, we are going to change it. That's why. We're looking at the disease because we're going to change it. God, through us, is going to change it. Now, he told me that this morning in my meditation. That's why I don't go to breakfast. I take that time to talk to him, you know. So, I'm not blaming them because it happened before this generation. Some time ago, oh, centuries ago, the big brass hats in the church, you know, got the idea that Christianity should be rational. Now, you know, that's the silliest thing. God is too big to be rational. Our little human minds are too small to understand all the mysteries of God. And as soon as you say, well, Christianity has got to be rational, we don't have to believe anything that we can't understand. Or we used to say we don't have to believe anything we can't see. Then you put God in a box, and he simply will not stay there because it's his nature to forever expand. I'm telling you that is the nature of God. In one way, he changes not because his nature changes not. In another way, he changes continually because his nature is creativity. 
And he continually expands and continually creates. And if I had time, I'd give you quite a talk on astronomy, which happens to be my pet subject, and the most amazing and wonderful study of the glory of God. But I, I don't have time to go into that. God inspired me to study astronomy when I went to college, and I've kept up with it ever since. I will just say that one time in Scotland, I gave a lecture on the nebula theory of creation as taught in the most modern of astronomy, the very most modern. Now, 100 years ago, no. 50 years ago, no. But now, science is beginning to find out. And I compared it to Genesis 1, and I showed how, if you just use your common sense and your imagination a little bit, you see it clicks exactly. When I came out of church, a tall young man said to me, Oh, I say, I am an astronomer. And I said, Oh, oh. <laughs> and he said, It's quite true. All you said, it is quite true. Praise God that modern science is beginning to blast our old false theories of theology. Can't believe what you can't see. Who's ever seen an atom? Who's ever seen gravity? Who's ever seen magnetism? Well, but however, the church, unfortunately, has still not come out of the box of those dark ages. So therefore, since they cannot understand the reality of God and the reality of Jesus, the tendency is to substitute there's something they can understand, which is social action and psychology. Now, psychology is all right, but as a friend of mine says, you've got to use your head once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is all right, but it does not fit every need. It is just splendid when it's what we need, but it does not take the place of Jesus. And I'm going to tell you now, Nothing takes the place of Jesus. Not all the social, social action. You can try to change the world by changing the laws and the social systems, and you can keep that up forever, world without end, and it won't change the world because there's only one thing that can change the world, and that is Jesus. And unless the change comes from inside by Jesus, indwelling and forgiving sins and opening doors for the light of his Holy Spirit. You can change the system, but the reality is not changed. The new system you think is going to be so fine will get just as rotten as the old one. Now that's history. You don't have to believe me. Study history. So, there is only one thing that can change, and that is Jesus. But these dear people in seminaries are sort of caught in their own system. Now, I'm not mad with them. I'm sorry for them. I'm sorry for them. Because, you see, for the most part, they have not experienced Jesus. And they do not experience Jesus. Now, this is not in criticism. It's not their fault. That is the way they were taught. And that is the way they are teaching the students, and that I know very well. My son, being a minister... And he went into the ministry out of an interest in helping people. He does it in a somewhat different way from mine, but I'm telling you, the people that come to him, that's what they need, and it really works. A very wise and profound combination of understanding of the human mind and soul that he's gotten through psychology and religion. But at the end of his second year in seminary, he conked out, and so did nine men in his class, and he's the only one who was able to pull himself together after going through a year of severe mental depression and disturbance. I mean it nearly wrecked him. I do mean it. And of the nine, he's the only one managed to go back. So you see what I'm getting at? I would not say this unless I had a very definite purpose. And this is tremendously exciting. I've never suggested this before, but I, I was guided to this morning. The Lord said, ask them. 
So I'm asking you, if each one of you, now not right this minute perhaps, well, or perhaps this minute if the Lord guides you, if each one of you will do this great thing, if you will pray for one seminary, now just one, and pray for Jesus to get in there somehow. You know, the Jesus people, whom I just think are perfectly wonderful, they don't know everything, neither do I, but they can do things that I haven't got the nerve to do. <laughs> I haven't got the nerve to go up and down Sunset Strip and speak to a perfect stranger and say, Sir, do you know you're a, Christ you're a sinner? But do you know that God loves you? And do you know that God sent Jesus into the world to die for your sins? But they have. <laughs> and they've said this to all kinds of people from Billy Graham. They did to him one time. I heard that he, <laughs> he wanted to see what really went on, so he got dark glasses and a wig and a roll-top sweater, and he went down Sunset Strip, and that's just exactly what went on. <laughs> and he said, praise the Lord. He said, they've got it. It's real. I'm all for them. They've got a direct contact with Jesus. And they've got the courage to tell people. And I've heard the young ones testify to this. Ones who are utterly lost and in the gutter, totally, completely hooked on the drugs and sex and everything else. And suddenly, they came to know Jesus. And they were healed and they were transformed. As I say, they don't know everything yet. But what they do know, they put it into action with the utmost perfectly marvelous zeal and enthusiasm and joy, and I thank God for them. However, they don't know everything yet, and neither do I. And they have got the idea that Jesus is coming perhaps next week, or at the very latest, week after next. <laughs> oh, wouldn't that be exciting? I wish you would. I just wish he would. I just wish he would. But I just simply don't know. And I ask him, and he doesn't tell me. <laughs> and he said in the Bible, you know, of that day knoweth no man. So I just have to wait and see. And I just do not know when Jesus is coming again. But look, it's the fact that they believe Jesus is right around the corner about to pop in that gives them such joy and that gives them such power. Now, why can't we believe that in one way, if not in another? I mean, whether he will rapture them all, as they like to say. I do not like that word. It is not grammatically correct. But, you know, that's what they say. In fact, I saw a bumper sticker on an automobile that said, in case of rapture, this car will self-destruct. <laughs> the purple stickers that say honk if you love Jesus <laughs> and when I pass one like that I always honk and uh, and they're in the car four five or six young people do this you know one way Jesus oh I think that's the most thrilling thing that's ever happened I just think it's perfectly wonderful now look in our own way could we dare to believe that Somehow, Jesus is coming again. I do not know how. The prophecies confuse me, and they scare me, kind of, and I really do not know much better. But I know this. Jesus did say he's coming again. And it may be that he'll walk in that door in the flesh so you can see him with your eyes. Or it may be that he'll walk into your soul so that you can see him with the eyes of your spirit. But you know, the kids are right. In one way or another, he is coming again. This is the changing time. This is the dawning of a new age. Now, I don't personally really feel that it's the end of the world or the end of civilization, as my son Jack said. He said, maybe so, but he said, I don't really think so. And he said, after all, if God did destroy the world at this time, I'd be very much disappointed in him. 
in the Creator because things are just beginning to get interesting. <laughs> well, but however, I'm not saying you won't. I don't know. But all I'm saying is this is unquestionably a new age. Things are happening today that 10 years ago did not happen and apparently could not happen. Why, I know this group in Costa Mesa, you may have read about them. These young people, they started in a Lutheran church. It was a small church, small congregation, and they permitted the kids to use it. And there was a minister, just an ordinary garden variety minister, as I understand it, middle-aged, bald, and I've never seen him, but I mean nobody, <clears throat> nobody weird, you know, at all. But just somebody that believed in Jesus and in his Holy Spirit. And an old friend of mine went down to Costa Mesa to see what was going on. He said he thought it would be rather noisy. Well, some of them are, but this one was not. He said there were 600 young people, sang one hymn in the beginning, one hymn at the end, and the rest of the two hours, there they sat with their Bibles open, taking notes while the preacher taught them out of the scriptures. And then they went out, and another 600 came in, just waiting their time to come in. Now they put up a big marquee there so they can hold more. And when this minister gets enough of them really and truly converted, he's a Baptist minister, and he holds a baptism service in the Pacific Ocean. It's the only place big enough. And last time he baptized a thousand. And they came up out of the water filled with the joy of the Lord, knowing they were forgiven of their sins, and their sins were many and great with most of them. Drugs, sex, and everything else, you know. Loving each other, forgiving each other, some of them with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, some of them not, but all with the love of Jesus. Jesus had come to them. Now, how else he's going to come, I don't know. But can we dare to believe that Jesus really and truly is on the march? His footsteps are shaking the earth now. Now look, can we dare to ask him to please come into this seminary, the one we've got, the one that's our prayer project? and just literally bowl them over and transform them as he has done these lost children on the seashore of California? Let's try. Let's begin now. Lord Jesus, we do not know what you have in mind, but we do know that you are coming again in a new way and that you are going to overturn some of our things in this earth, like you marched into the temple and you overturned the tables of the money changers. And this is going to be a time of glory and of joy for all of us who love you, Lord Jesus. I don't know how you're going to manage it, but somehow I know you are coming again. Your Holy Spirit is making a new move upon this earth. Your Holy Spirit is surging forth. And the work of your Holy Spirit is to testify of you, Lord Jesus. The Holy Spirit, the Bible says, does not testify of himself, but he testifies of Jesus. So now, Lord Jesus... Each one of us is going to hold up before you in our minds one seminary. I say each one, many of us, I hope, are willing to take on this job. I've got mine. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you will march into this seminary in such a real way that the old worn out ideas of salvation without you will be overturned like the tables of the money changers and that those who teach in these seminaries will suddenly know that you the Lord are returning 
As you told us in the Bible, in various stories, the man that owned a vineyard, he went away for a long time, and then he returned. And he wasn't happy with the people who were not managing his vineyard in the right way. So we're going to picture this, and the result of it will be a great revival in that seminary. And the presence and power of the Lord sweeping through there like a strong wind blowing away everything that is not of the Lord or everything that is okay but secondary and bringing in Jesus and putting him on the throne. And then the students who go to that seminary will rejoice and be deeply comforted. Oh, they will rejoice and be deeply comforted because this is what they went into the ministry hoping to find. So now, Lord Jesus, we believe that this is going to be so. And I trust that everyone here, or certainly a great many of them, will really and truly do this. Now, they may tell their prayer groups or close prayer partners, please, to pray with them, but they must not go around telling everybody because that would spoil it. But I believe that this is going to be so, and I believe that while I'm still living and walking around on this earth, I'm going to see it happen more and more. One after another, one after another, the seminaries topple off of their false human foundations and be built all over again on the rock. He is my rock. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.